So first, uh, a bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is John Rose. I'm the uh, Global Chief Technology Officer for this new company called Dell EMC. If you didn't see the news, uh, September 7th, uh, we merged uh, Dell, which is a privately held company with a number of assets, with EMC, which was a federation of companies, including VMware, Pivotal, RSA, VirtuStream, uh, into one uh, very large $75 billion technology company privately held with a gentleman named Michael Dell as the chairman and majority shareholder. Um, interesting times. Uh, I spent the last year before that uh, working on the technical integration and making sure that we, uh, we kind of landed all in the right spot. So I, I've been a very busy year. The good news is uh, you didn't hear the world end or the companies collapse when September 7th hit, so we feel like we accomplished our job. Um, that was, you know, small, small, small victories. Um, now we're in existence and moving forward, but my, my role at the, at the company is I'm the overall global ch chief technology officer, but I also, because of my background, I run R&D groups. I'm responsible for what's called cross-product operations, which is all of the shared engineering services and also the technology strategy and architecture for the combined product lines. So consider me the bookends of, uh, of this entity. Um, the good news about that is that I am, am not the typical, uh, let's call it, not, no offense to anyone who carries this title, CTO, uh, in the sense that I only focus on the future. I actually have to make it real and deliver it and get held accountable for it. So it does uh, put some grounding on, on these discussions. Um, from a background perspective, I, I, uh, I joined EMC about four and a half years ago. Um, prior to that, I was the head of advanced technology for a small Chinese company called Huawei. Um, where I built and ran an entity called Futureway out in California, uh, where we went out and poached during the, uh, the last kind of recession about 1,100 of the best technologies in the valley to go work on advanced technology for a very large Chinese company, which was interesting. If you get the opportunity to work for a large Chinese company and you are interested in cultural anthropology, it is quite interesting. Um, technologically, it's interesting too, but uh, it's more the anthrop anthropological part. Um, prior to that, I was the, uh, the, the global CTO and head of R&D for a small Canadian company called Nortel. I worked out of Ottawa, Canada and ran about 12,000 engineers around the world. Uh, that was interesting. Um, many of you uh, probably have some touch point to Nortel. I've actually learned in my career that uh, Nortel is one of those companies that suffers from the Kevin Bacon rule. Um, it's basically the two degrees of separation of Nortel. Uh, and I've pretty much found that anybody I've ever met has some one or two degree separation from somebody or something related to Nortel given its size and 115 year history, um, which is good because quite frankly in the technical community connectedness is, is interesting. Um, before that I was the CTO of a small semiconductor company in California called Broadcom, um, just to keep things interesting. Uh, and then before that I spent the bulk of my early career actually in this area um, prior to Broadcom being the CTO and also Chief Marketing Officer and CIO of a company called Interesis, which is now part of Extreme Networks. And then before that, I kind of grew up in a crazy little company up in New Hampshire called Cabletron Systems, which any of you in this area probably had some experience with. Uh, uh, two really interesting characters founded it, and uh, uh, we grew from two guys in a garage in, uh, in Massachusetts to uh, about 7,000 people around the world, about 50% of the land hubbing market, if anybody remembers hubs. Um, anyway, uh, if anybody's got an MMAC floating around, let me know. I'd like to get one for my collection. Um, anyway, so, so this morning, uh, you know, I'm glad to be here. Uh, by the way, this is a, a break for me. I, I, I honestly have been up to my eyeballs for a year integrating companies and dealing with uh, organizations and trying to rationalize product lines. So I'm, I actually really enjoy the chance to step out of that and spend a few hours with a technical community talking about something completely different or having a conversation about something unrelated to the integration of Dell EMC or the, uh, the kind of things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I appreciate you having me. Uh, I know you didn't intend for it to be a vacation for me, but uh, it definitely has that effect. It's kind of my sanity check. I don't know if any other people would say standing up in front and talking to you is a sanity check, but we'll see. Um, Anyway, so, so what I wanted to talk to you today about, uh, given the, the overall agenda of the conference, obviously is going to cover a lot of areas at a very deep level, I thought I'd cast kind of a wide net. And, you know, the, 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 the general theme is one of change. Um, let, me, let me ask a, a real simple demographic question. Um, who in this room was in the industry five years ago? Okay, I hope everybody's hands come up, or most of them. Uh, keep your hands up if it was 10 years, 20 years. 30 years, 50 years, I've had a few. Um, 
Actually, I think Vince Cerf was in at one time. So anyway, um, the, one of the things, if you've been in this industry for more than five years, and it really requires about that amount of time, is you have seen change. You know, it, it, there is no such thing as constant in our industry. Um, but the one thing that's different about the change going on right now is that previously the change was kind of single dimensional. You know, we had a change in the internet materialized, so IP became the new way to do transmission. But compute didn't really change radically at the same time. <laughs> uh, applications and programming language were evolving on a different pace, but it wasn't massive disruption up and down the stack. Today, however, we have a situation where almost every layer of the IT stack, almost everything from the most uh, primitive atomic units of physical layer, all the way up to the way that we actually develop code, are being radically reinvented simultaneously. And you know that's both good and bad. The good is if you're an optimist, it gives you a lot of new things to learn, and, and quite frankly, if you're technical and can adapt, you have plenty of job security. Um, on the other hand, the bad is you know we don't get a lot of sleep. Um, it's kind of uh, disruptive. Uh, when we change things, we create entropy and things break, and most of us are in the business of fixing things when they break, um, so we get very busy. Um, but, but personally, I actually like periods of change. I, I wish it would slow down a little bit more, but I want to talk to you about how we see that change from a very high level, and then we're going to drill down into kind of four examples of changes in the stack, ranging from physical layer, physical componentry. I'll pick a, one that I'm kind of spend a lot of time on these days around, uh, let's call it persistence media, all the way through to how change is occurring with people, and how we develop code, and how computer scientists come into existence, and how we deal with them. So let me start with a um, simple demographic uh, of companies. I love this chart because it tells you something about the fact that don't get complacent. And it basically says that 52% of the S&P 500 from 15 years ago don't exist anymore. And the reason they don't exist isn't because they all went out of business, even though many of them did, because quite frankly they got displaced, they got disrupted, some of them got converged, some of them got acquired, some of them shrunk. But the bottom line is if 50% of the largest companies in the world don't even exist anymore after 15 years, something's going on. There are disruptions happening, and they're not just disruptions around the adoption of a technology or the adoption of a process. They're actually disrupting entire business structures and ecosystems and industries. And you know, if you, if, as any CEO will tell you, uh, this is what keeps them up at night. They want to be on the right hand side of this, not the left hand side of this. Interestingly enough, if we double click down a level, and many of you are IT professionals and are responsible for you know IT assets. Um, what you realize is that that change, because of this panic at the CEO level about the fact that I could be disrupted, my entire industry could be destroyed if I don't adapt, is now propagating into the expectations of IT. Your information technology systems from 10 years ago, the objectives of them were to deploy an application, to connect people, to run a database. That's the kind of tasks we were given. Today, these are the kind of things that IT professionals are told to go do. Hey, use some technology so that we can predictively spot new opportunities. What the heck does that mean? You know, the technology is a component, but there's an expectation that by using technology, we're going to be able to get insights that we couldn't get before that will help us adapt our overall business model before somebody else does. And the dependence is not on some financial analyst to do that. It's an expectation that technology will get us there. The second, there is an expectation, driven not by the enterprise side, but actually by the consumer side, that the experience of interacting with IT systems will be hyper-personalized. You know, I, mean, I, I did a presentation about 10 years ago at, at uh, Interop, uh, where I talked about the fact that IT used to be the cool place. And if any of you have been here in the industry for more than 10 years, or more than about probably 20 years now, 20 years ago, you went to work to use the cool technology. You didn't go home to do it. About 10 years ago, that flipped. It still has flipped, but it's gotten worse in the sense that even though we're now adopting consumerized technology in the enterprise, the actual experience that you have outside of an enterprise in terms of the personalization of the experience, the way that you feel like it's your IT experience, is so much better than what we get in a typical IT environment that there's now an expectation that we have to match that, which is not trivial. Because one of the things that's nice when you build an at-scale system is if it's uniform. <laughs> if I tell you that now it has to be hyper-personalized, all that uniformity and the advantages of building it that way suddenly aren't available to me. So I have to think differently about how I develop it. 
The third is that they're expecting you to not just innovate with technology in new ways, but actually bring business innovation. To actually use technology that unlocks a different way to run a supply chain or to do healthcare. And we've talked about that for ages, but it never really happened. I mean, how many of you are involved? I mean, when I was CTO in Nortel, we did tons of work around automatic patient discharge in healthcare and all these kind of cool things that you could do with an IVR system linked to a unified communication system, unified to a Wi-Fi environment with location tracking. We actually built those in 2005, but people didn't use them because they actually didn't care if the technology could do something cool in the healthcare setting. Now, there's an expectation that all that stuff they see on television or in science fiction actually is achievable right now. That these crazy experiences that aren't actually real yet are actually an outcome of their IT investment. The fourth, how many of you know a guy named Paul Moritz? Anybody? No. Paul was the uh, CEO, well, he was at Microsoft forever, and then he was, he was one of the early Microsoft employees, then he was the CEO of VMware, so John knows him. Uh, and then he came over when, when I joined EMC, it was part of this big executive shuffle. Paul came back from VMware to figure out what eventually would become Pivotal. Uh, and Paul has a great statement. He, when, when he was developing the model for Pivotal, he said, one of our outcomes, the goals of Pivotal, is that we, we believe that if we do this right, we will be able to reason across data as it is being collected to influence the outcome of events as they're happening. Now, that sounds pretty obvious, but that was the goal, and that's a big aspirational goal, and it really translates into what real time means. You know, some of us think real time is just streaming data, but it's not. Real time is being able to influence reality as it's occurring because there are sources of information that can actually change our decision making on the fly as human beings and systems are interacting with that data. And that is a very different paradigm because in the past we were given the luxury of landing huge quality, quantities of data into our systems of record, analyzing them, and then using them at a later date. You know, we did a bunch of work in telecom for Vodafone and we have a system called RTI that deals with kind of moving call data records and then telecom analysis from non-real time to real time. And one of the first use cases was when you have a dropped call in a telecommunication vendor, when your cell phone drops a call, there is a report that gets generated about a month later. It kind of tells you, yeah, you had a certain number of drop calls, hey, that's kind of bad. The problem is if you find out that as the operator that most of your customers are irritated with you because there were lots of dropped calls a month after it happened, there's not very much you can do about it. In fact, if you do something a month later and send them a credit, all you did is remind them a month later after they got over it that they had this horrible experience, okay? <laughs> So with Vodafone, we ended up using, in this case, Gemfire and the Spring Framework, and we, we went into real time. It was a massive compute job. We were using trillions of events coming into these systems to say, what if we could gather all the signaling information, we could capture the information coming in when a drop call occurred. It's really just an ISMI and some basic information. Enrich it, figure out if that's a good customer, a bad customer, why it dropped, and then take a proactive action like automatically reconnecting their call or sending them a text right away saying, hey, we know your call got dropped, click here to reconnect, you're not getting billed for it. And to do that whole thing in 100 milliseconds and to do it at millions of events per second. That changes that experience in a way that is positive as opposed to just giving somebody a credit a month later. Those expectations are now permeating the entire industry. And then lastly, because we're generally dealing with businesses, we have to do all this and we have the ongoing requirement to do it with transparency and trust. These things have to work. We are regulated. We are liable. And quite frankly, no matter what innovation we adopt today, we have not ceded our responsibility to meet our regulatory compliance and legal obligations as companies, which really creates an added complexity on top of everything else. But by the way, none of this is debatable anymore. If you are in a business delivering technology to that business, if it hasn't happened yet, it will. These will be the kind of expectations and outcomes people are expecting from their IT investment. The second major change, however, is that it's great. We have these new things to deal with. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just enhance our existing system, make it better? We have an IT architecture. We have to add some new capability to it. But unfortunately, simultaneous to these new expectations, we have basically bifurcated the IT architectures. And sometimes we use terms like platform two and platform three or software resilient and hardware resilient architectures. But the bottom line is what's going on in almost every IT environment today at the base level is we're distributing the IT resources into clouds and we know that. They're just distributed data centers, some that you own, some that you don't own, some that are operated by you, some that are operated by other people, but we're over that now. We'll talk about that a little later. 
Um, it is a multi-cloud world, and there's an expectation that your resources will be distributed across multiple IT architectures from a compute, storage, IO, et cetera perspective. But even worse, above it, there are actually two IT stacks that are now necessary that operate co-resident to solve these problems. One is the traditional, what we'll call hardware resilient legacy stack, if you will. It is about applications that, quite frankly, expect infrastructure to make them stable, make them work. The app doesn't really know what the infrastructure is, but it has huge dependencies on it. And the app tends to be monolithic and scale up as opposed to scale out. And right next to it, over the last several years, we have started to introduce scale out, distributed, cloud native software architectures and stack architectures where we are building entirely new classes of applications and architectures. If any of you have done work with microservices or containers, you understand that that is very different than the stack that you're running your SAP system on or your Oracle system on. The problem is they're not moving from one to the other. They're actually coexisting. In fact, what we're seeing in big environments like SAP, uh, if you're familiar with SAP, pretty dominant technology out there, the next generation of SAP has two major thrusts. One is a reinvention of the system of record, the database, to HANA, an in-memory architecture, but it actually looks a lot like that thing on the left-hand side, just uses a slightly different set of technologies underneath it. And on the right-hand side is a distributed cloud-native framework built on Cloud Foundry to basically reinstantiate the applications as microservices. And the two will work together to create a system of record and system of engagement for SAP in the future. You can't do just one. And so everyone in this room that might be an expert on that left-hand side also has to become an expert on the right-hand side, and we technologically have to enhance both of them because they're both necessary, and we have to figure out how to make them work over a heterogeneous set of distributed IT infrastructure in public, private, and hybrid clouds. You know, not like our lives were complex enough. Um, bottom line, main reason we're doing this is because we don't want this to happen. Um, you know. There are lots of examples where a company in an industry materialized and came up with a new business model, but the business model wasn't some creative Harvard MBA discussion. It was driven by early adoption of a technology. Every one of these examples used a technology that other people in their industry didn't use to get that advantage that allowed them to scale their business and disrupt their industry. The pattern repeats. Every industry in the world will have this happen to them. And candidly, the only way we navigate it is that we have to change. We have to learn how to use new IT architectures. We have to learn how to use new technology. We have to assume that the outcomes that we're trying to shoot for are not just about implementing the technology, but making them useful around those five characteristics. And so I wanted to spend a little time with you today talking about some of the things over the next several years that we have to focus on to try to make that possible, to do this change. Bottom line, though, is it is impossible for me to cover all of them. <laughs> Everything that you know, every technology, whether it be networking or compute or storage or uh, virtualization or application development or programming languages or databases is going through a disruption. But I kind of felt like it would be interesting to illustrate the fact that it's happening everywhere by kind of walking the stack from the bottom to the top. And so I thought I'd start at the bottom, uh, something near and dear to my heart, the storage industry. The idea of persisting bits. You know, obviously EMC is the market leader in storage. We have like 35% of the bits in the world land on our stuff. Um, you know, contrary to popular belief, we build a lot of cloud infrastructure. We have exascale systems running underneath some of the consumer brands that you use today. But the bottom line is, the core currency of the storage industry is the persistence of bits. This idea that we have to actually persist data somewhere in an efficient way that we can access and process. Now, the good news is that we have seen tremendous advances in the storage industry, but we are just at the beginning of a pretty significant inflection. Probably the best advances have been, you know, we've moved from the hard drive era to hybrid arrays to all flash. That's old news, but the bottom line is we're talking orders of magnitude improvement in transaction rate. Does anybody know the kind of IOP, the, the, the let's call it the, the, the order of magnitude of IOPS on a hard drive, a spinning disk hard drive versus a solid state drive. How many orders of magnitude in terms of the number of IOPS you can get out of one drive? Probably at least four orders of magnitude, okay? It's not like a spinning disk does 50 IOPS and an SSD does 100. It's like a, 50, a spinning disk does 50 and an SSD does 100,000, <laughs> okay? So, you know, Massive improvements, which is great, and it's caused some disruptions. 
it's actually broken our world a little bit. You know, there's this whole industry called 15K and 10K drives that are dead. Okay? If you are in the 15K drive business, the high performance spinning rust, go get another job. Okay? There is no market for you because the crossover point, not just in terms of performance, that happened on day one of Flash, but now on economics has already happened. In fact, you know, from a marketing perspective, it was kind of humorous last, you know, this year, early this year, we declared it the year of all flash for transactional workloads. I love the marketing guys, you know, they, like they're stating the obvious and it's a great marketing campaign. But it was actually accurate and it was driven by a data point. We watch very closely the, the price performance and characteristics of media because that's the currency of our storage industry. And we, and we could predict that there would be a moment in time where a particular media, in this case, high performance spinning magnetic media, would be rendered obsolete on all dimensions, performance, cost, power, MTBF, by a disruptor called solid state. And we reasonably predicted it for this year, and it did happen. And at that point, we pretty much deprecated it from our product lines. We'll still sell it to people who haven't installed, but we don't try to position that anymore because it makes no sense. No matter how religiously attached you are to that technology, it is irrelevant now. And in almost every other technology area, there are technologies that are absolutely going to disappear. And we're just going to have to let go of them and move on. Um, I was going to make a joke about USB-C, but um, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so you guys would get that. Um, however, this media transformation that's going on to solid state, we may think that, hey, now we're in an all-flash world. We're done. <laughs> we're at version 1. We have a huge inflection coming at us that is starting to begin now. It will actually hit late next year, and it will accelerate over probably the next three to five years, and it has significantly more disruptive potential up and down the stack because of a change of media than anything we've seen in the last 50 years. The biggest change that's coming is this evolution away from NAND flash, which is not an execute in place environment. It is a storage layer to this idea of storage class memories, non-volatile memories, persistent memories, and the presence of those technologies, if you look at them, and you can see the kind of scale at the bottom, we are starting to see those yellow circles, technologies materialize that have the characteristics of a storage media, meaning they can store huge quantities of data cost effectively, but have the performance characteristics of DRAM, but also can operate as an execute in place environment. So this idea of storing in one place and executing in another place starts to disappear or blur. It doesn't mean DRAM goes away, because DRAM actually does have some characteristics that you will use, but the memory architectures are now going to include persistence at a level we've never seen before. The challenge with this is that it forces us to kind of rethink all kinds of things across our, our architectures. Unfortunately, uh, this is an interesting space. Like all new technology inflections, the idea of persistent memory is a great idea, but how do you go off and actually do it? What's the physics involved in it? What's the chemistry involved in it? And so today there are half a dozen different next generation memory technologies. I will tell you today, at least half to two thirds of them will never see the light of day. Um, they're kind of science projects. Resisted RAM is a good one that I don't think that's ever gonna happen. Maybe it will, but um, mostly it's failed. Um, 3D Crosspoint, which, by the way, really is spin torque as far as I'm concerned. Intel will not tell you that, and they, they deny that it is, but it uses the same kind of basic architecture. Um, carbon nanotubes, you know, magnetic media, these are all different technologies that give us options. But let me paint you a picture. Now, this is all uh, two disclo disclaimers. First of all, it's all publicly available. You can find it, so I'm not sharing anything confidential here. Second is, most of these systems don't exist yet, so they're not fully characterized, so they're subject to change. <laughs> But if you believe what people are telling you, and you look at the characteristics of these different non-volatile memory technologies compared to DRAM and NAND at the two bookends, you see that read latency, read-write performance, write bandwidth, retention, meaning how long they can persist data without being refreshed, uh, access granularity, which is the difference between an execute-in-place environment that you can do byte-level access as opposed to block-level access, endurance, meaning how long before they wear out, uh, whether they can be implemented in additional geometries, multi-level cell, so you can actually have more bits per cell uh, using different encoding schemes, 
or that you can do 3D stacking, where you can layer them on top of each other and create another dimension to the density. And if you look, and I won't drain this, but you can see that there's some pretty interesting things here. <laughs> you know, take uh, 3D Crosspoint, which is probably the most popular one that's out there, and Intel has samples out now. They don't really have it shipping. It probably, you won't see it available to people until sometime next year. Um, but you look at this and go, you have a system that's got 100 nanosecond read latency, you know, close to symmetric read-write performance versus NAND, which has, you know, a 10 to 1, 20 to 1 difference. Uh, write bandwidth is you know, hundreds of megabytes, which is pretty good. Um, it can retain data without being refreshed for months. <laughs> kind of useful. <laughs> you can turn your system off and turn it back on and all the data is still there in memory. Kind of cool. Um, it's a byte level access system. It's got very decent endurance, similar to NAND flash. Uh, obviously that changes as you change the geometry and stack it and put more cells or more bit patterns in the cell. Um, what would you do with that? <laughs> you know, what does that change? If suddenly your media is chips that can hold, you know, hundreds of, uh, well, probably, let's say, hundreds of gigabytes, <laughs> persistently and execute on them and access them as if they're memory, what would that do to your database architecture? How would you think differently about your applications if that was an underlying component you could use? It doesn't exist today. It's not available to you, but it's coming. These are all real. <laughs> Seen parts on all of them. We've tested all of them. And so this disruption, which quite frankly, inevitably is going to change the way we do storage. It's going to change the way computer architectures are implemented. If you look at Intel's next generation architectures, they contemplate this idea of non-volatile memory. If you're familiar with things like NVMe and NVMe over fabrics as new interconnect technologies, they are driven not because they want to connect a bunch of NAND flash. They are driven because they want to connect this stuff to the system. If you look at technology initiatives like Gen Z, if you're familiar with that, which is a new kind of interconnect initiative, it's not about connecting peripherals, it's about extending memory across a distributed system, across a high performance, low latency I.O. bus, because it's likely that the memory systems are going to look like this. Now, at a physical layer, that's pretty cool. And if you haven't thought about it, I'd encourage you to go off and kind of think about what this might do to your system architecture if suddenly you get a server that's got, you know, a couple of terabytes of persistent memory, or a couple of hundred terabytes of persistent memory, or a petabyte of persistent memory in it, and you're trying to build a database architecture or do in-memory processing. And if you compare that to NAND or DRAM, you start to see that there's a blurring between them. And that the, quite frankly, the NAND market is probably going to be impacted and the DRAM market's going to be impacted. But again, we don't want to spend a lot of time on that because most of you are software people. Let's think about it from a software architecture perspective. Today, when you deal with a compute architecture, you deal with two completely independent semantics with data. You deal with storage semantics, where you actually read and write blocks or files to some kind of system to persist them. And then when you want to execute on them, what are the steps that you take? You go out into that storage system, and you extract that data, you read it, you organize it, you place it into memory, and then you process it. Kind of, kind of interesting takes a lot of time. Any of you have characterized those systems, a huge amount of your latency is moving data back and forth between these systems. And your programming semantics are actually quite complex because you're dealing with a whole set of storage semantics down in the stack and a whole different approach to dealing with it as you're actually executing the code or processing the data. So as we go forward, interestingly enough, because now we have this idea of scalable persistent memory, that our storage and our execution environment are actually likely to be the same thing. It might be a tier of different classes of these memories, but they are now integrated into one system. You start to bias towards memory semantics. You're really doing load stores into your system. You know, imagine if you were loading data into memory and just leaving it there forever. Imagine if you were accessing it using those memory semantics. Imagine if you could literally deal with an infinite memory pool instead of you know, dealing with it the way that we have to do now, which is memory management and paging and all of these other things. They just disappeared, or at least they changed in a significant way. What would that do to your overall application architecture? I'm not going to tell you all the implications of this, but hopefully you understand the significant, profound change this is going to do to computer architectures coming forward. The problem with it is, is law of unintended consequences. Can anybody think of a potential problem with having your execution environment persist on a compute node 
permanently, even if you power cycle it. Bingo, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> you know, you've blown up your system, you have something corrupt, there's a memory fault, and you reboot your system, and everything's still there. So we have new problems to solve. The first new problem is how on earth do you deal with error recovery in this model? And it sounds simple, but there's not a lot of contemplation of this in the way that we deal with it in traditional memory architectures, because we assume it essentially gets wiped clean when you reset the system. That's your last resort. It disappears from the structure. There are other problems that we have to solve. For instance, it's likely that this will not be one class of memory that makes up this persistent memory architecture. It will be tiers of it. You will have low cost and higher cost. You will have lower performance and higher performance persistent memory. And you will start to have tiering algorithms in which you will be paging across these or moving data and escalating it based on hotspots and heat maps. Now, we do some of that memory management today, but not to the degree that we're going to have to. In fact, we've had a project going on at EMC for about five years called Memory Centric Architectures, AD project. And the two things that we actually ended up having to modify were memcached and malloc. We had to go in and actually rewrite them because they don't contemplate this kind of media underneath it. And so imagine, you know, you now have a system where you're building an application. It literally looks downstream and doesn't see storage and memory. It just sees an infinite pool of persistent memory. And the underlying operating systems and data services around it have to make that survivable, recoverable, have to make sure it's efficient, have to make sure it's performant. And none of that media exists today, but it is likely to be mainstream in two years. So what's the implication of this? Yeah, the, the chips are a big implication. Building the hardware systems are an implication. But now we step up a layer and we have to think about the implications on the operating system on the database architectures, on the application development, on our assumptions about performance. So again, I don't want to drain it, but you know, just to kind of wake you up about, there's things coming <laughs> that are going to be disruptive. So shifting gears, going up a level. If at the foundational level, the underlying silicon is changing around things like what we just described, if we go up a level into the next tier of architecture, kind of how we do processing, clearly the big disruption there is cloud. And you know, I hate the term, it's a kind of stupid term. It, it, you know, I'm a networking guy, and I, I, any of you are networking people, what do you think of the term switch? If you were an 802.1 person and the word switch came out, did you have the same reaction I had when that marketing happened? It's a bridge, it's 802.1D bridge, full stop, it's a bridge. Why are we calling it a switch? It does the same thing as a bridge, but we marketed it differently. Cloud is a marketing message, but it does indicate a change in our topology. It says we are now trying to abstract away the underlying compute storage I.O. in a way that we can consume it in different ways. It's still compute storage and I.O. But nevertheless, what's interesting is there's an ongoing war right now about how you're going to build your cloud architecture. Where are you going to run your compute jobs? Where are you going to store your data? And let me give you the spectrum. On one side, there's a spectrum that believes that you will completely make infrastructure transparent. You won't care. You will use one cloud to solve them all, and someone else will handle that for you. Let me dispel that one for you. If you look at the most advanced technology companies in the world, have they outsourced their infrastructure? <laughs> Never. <laughs> They'd be insane to do it. The reason is that they understand that the actual outcome of an IT stack is a combination of two things. The infrastructure that delivers performance, economics, scale, and the code that gets executed. And while granted, there's an over-rotation in enterprise right now to the code side, because they don't want to think about infrastructure for a while, because it's hard. Clouds are hard, and there's, these, there's public clouds that can actually give you kind of a turnkey solution that you don't have to think about it anymore. That isn't really a long-term winning formula for things that you have to differentiate yourself on, because if you're the company that ignored infrastructure, and you use the same infrastructure as everybody else and write a neat piece of code, and one of your competitors actually builds the infrastructure and has 10x the performance, half the cost, and greater scale. Even if your code is equivalent, they win. And it doesn't mean that everybody has to build their own bespoke infrastructure. It also doesn't mean that you don't use public clouds. But there is differentiation of both layers. And candidly, that has debunked this myth a bit of infrastructure doesn't matter, the clouds will handle it. They are a component of the ecosystem, but there will still be other infrastructures that are relevant to other workloads that allow them to differentiate. And over time, what we've seen is it kind of settled on this geometry, that most enterprises, the vast majority, 
have kind of figured out that given a broad application of state and a large set of challenges, they're going to have to place the workload and data in the right kind of infrastructure that gives it the best outcome. And that is likely to lead to a multi-cloud environment. Now that is harder than a single cloud environment, public or private, but it is actually the one that is likely to endure. We will have to start to think about ways in which we know how to place a workload. You know, right now, you know, I speak, I, by the way, in addition to my role at EMC, I'm the chairman of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Cloud Foundry is probably the biggest open source initiative building out an open PaaS architecture. One of the characteristics of Cloud Foundry is that it can run over almost any cloud. It has CPIs for Google and Azure and Amazon and VMware and OpenStack and bare metal, and that's great. But the reality is, one thing that's missing that we're working on is it kind of treats them all equally. But they're not equal. <laughs> These clouds have different characteristics. But how do you manage this idea that you want to build an app, a cloud agnostic application, but then you want to run it and execute it in the best environment that gets you the best outcome? And so we have a ton of work in the multi-cloud world to try to figure out ways to properly place cloud native applications where they run best without tightly binding them to that infrastructure. It's kind of this. We want to cake our cake and eat it too. We want openness and portability, but we want to actually take advantage of the best infrastructure. By the way, if you look at the public clouds, if any of you have done performance testing on them, pick a dimension and Google Cloud Engine is different than Amazon, is different than Azure. Some better than others, which means that your choice of cloud, even in the public clouds, varies depending on what outcome you're trying to get to. More importantly, in an enterprise environment, the diversity of applications you're building likely are going to gravitate towards certain types of cloud architectures. You know, we use this vehicle to describe it. We talk about this idea of kind of off-prem, somebody else runs the infrastructure, versus on-prem, IT architects it. Platform two, which are hardware resilient applications, they're very dependent on the infrastructure, they, can't, they aren't really cloud native versus platform three, which are cloud native software resilient applications. And I guarantee you, if you go and inventory your current set of IT activities and assets, they're gonna be all over this map. And to be candid, if you try to place a mission critical bespoke application that you built only for your enterprise, that only runs a very custom application in a very high performant way in a factory or an engineering or a genomic environment, and you try to move it artificially into a completely homogeneous public cloud, it will fail. It will not have the resiliency, performance, or economics you're expecting. On the other hand, if you go out and build something in Amazon and try to bring it on-prem, it may work, but it might not work as well, and it might be actually very difficult to implement because some of the layers will be missing. So this multi-cloud model is likely to be the end state, even though today we don't really think about it that way. More importantly, when we think about problems to solve, we have five. The first is, for people like me, I have to have architectures that can build all four of these. When I build a cloud-native on-prem infrastructure, let's say you want to run Hadoop and Cloud Foundry on-premise, you do not build the IT infrastructure the same way as if you're building it to run Tableau over an SAP environment. Okay? It would make no sense to do that. You use different storage technologies, different compute architectures, different CI systems, different virtualization environments. So we actually have to figure out how to architect for all these. So any of you who are in architect roles, guess what? At a minimum, if you're dealing with on-prem, you have to become proficient not just in building your traditional systems, but also understanding what to take out of it, what to strip out of it to build the cloud native side so it's fully optimized. The fifth problem, however, which is the biggest one that we're facing, is how do you make these work together? How do you deal with cloud interworking? And cloud interworking is very simple. It says, our goal is not to build four independent silos that don't talk to each other. <laughs> Our goal is to build one IT infrastructure that consumes resources from four independent silos that don't talk to each other. And in order to do that, we have to figure out how data and compute and policy can move across these boundaries. We have a number of activities going on in the industry around data movement, things like cloud gateways. We have a number of them, there's lots of them out there that do things like convert block storage into S3 and object stores. Okay, pretty straightforward, not as trivial as you would think. You know, just taking a block and putting it into an object is easy. Dealing with the crypto boundary, dealing with the policy, dealing with the compliance, dealing with the billing, these are very complex things to do. By the way, we not only have to do that for block storage, we have to do it for file systems, we have to do it for data protection, we have to do it for key value stores. We even have to do it for object to object. 
because if you have an on-prem object store and an off-prem object store, guess what? They're not the same system. They have to be coordinated. They have to interwork. You step up a level and you get into compute. Well, how do you take a VM and make sure that it runs successfully off-prem? Now, there are VM architectures on either side, and there are ways to actually move a VM or to place an, a, a, a virtual machine running a piece of code on either side, but how do you deal with the security and policy pieces? How do you deal with secure delete? If you stand up an enterprise application and run it in Amazon, for instance, or Azure, and then you stop running it, what guarantees do you have that it's gone? Who is the authoritative control point for the crypto information on it? Did you control it, or is that being done by the cloud provider? Do you have any guarantee that they actually deleted all the information? These are problems that we're going to have to deal with. Then you get up above this, and you start talking about the actual applications themselves. How do you actually make these systems work together as a collective pool? One of the neat things about things like Cloud Foundry is, have any of you worked in Cloud Foundry? Cloud Foundry is kind of cool. And, you know, if, you want to, if you instantiate an application in Cloud Foundry, an application instance, you, know, you type in basically one command to launch it. <laughs> and if you want to scale it to 1,000 instances, you type in CF scale in the application instance, and you get 1,000 instances. It doesn't require an awful lot of manual intervention to actually deal with the infrastructure underneath it. But the amount of code inside of that system to actually automate the process of taking one instance and turning it into thousands of instances distributed across multiple IHASs is pretty sophisticated and pretty complex and actually pretty version one right now. But nevertheless, going forward, we're going to have to figure out how we actually use these as a collective system, how we actually make the data flow easily between them. In fact, one of the biggest challenges we have in multi-cloud environments is if the data does have to move, data has weight. Does anybody see last week at Amazon what one of their new product offerings was? It was a truck. <laughs> they literally drive a truck that's like a data vacuum cleaner into your data center and suck up all your data and drive it to their data center because that's easier than doing it over a network. Now, my, my question to them is, can I get the reverse? Is it okay if I don't if I want my data out? Will you bring it back? I didn't really hear, get a clear answer out of that from Werner and team. Um, but the bottom line is those are cloud interworking problems. And again, not to tell you all the answers, but the cloud era is not just about adopting cloud in which IT no longer has to deal with infrastructure. First of all, that's wrong. We still have to understand cloud architectures, even if we're just characterizing them and using them. But more importantly, we have to figure out how to actually make them work as a system. And we have a ton of problems to solve, just like those memory-centric architecture problems that haven't been solved yet, about how do we interwork across them? How do they work as a fungible pool? How do we have consistent policy and security across them? So if that wasn't enough, let's get to applications. Today, most application architectures have systems of record and systems of engagement. Those are kind of the terms we use. Systems of record are databases, primarily. Systems of engagement or UIs. They're applications that you touch and interact with. That's all good, except both of those are being turned on their head. Um, in general, they're being turned on their head in two dimensions. First, each of them are being reinvented. That SAP example is a good one, where SAP used to build big monolithic kind of applications that were what you interfaced with, and now they're turning those into microservices where you can build composable cloud-native applications to access and build your next generation SAP system of engagement. But on the system of record side, the biggest shift there, which by the way relates to item one on our list of things that are changing, is almost every system of record based on a database is moving to an in-memory model. And they're moving there because it just simply is faster to process data if it's sitting in memory at scale. And they're doing that not because they just want to build databases that use in-memory over DRAM, it's because most of the big database companies know that the underlying substrate of non-volatile memory and post-flash memory is coming. And so this idea of having hundreds of terabytes of data sitting inside of a system, long-term persistent, but actually looking like a memory pool, gives us an entirely new system of record architecture to deal with, which allows us to interact in ways that we've never done before, which allows us to go into real time. Interestingly enough, funny enough, the system of record and system of engagement architecture changes are actually also interrelated. And what we're actually now trying to build are systems in which these things actually coexist in really interesting new ways. You know, clearly, we start, in most cases, interestingly enough today, not with a system of record that's pre-populated. In fact, most modern IT application architectures think through the architecture but have nothing in the system of record to start. They build applications to gather data. 
You know, there's terms out there like Internet of Things, which is an example of, you know, why do you put a sensor out there? Not because it's the user interface, but because it's the data collection engine. And why are you collecting that data? Not because you just want to see the data of that sensor, but because you know that if you gathered the data of a lot of things, whether it be people providing input or sensors providing input, and you feed it into the next piece, which is that in-memory, large-scale data processing environment, you are going to be able to get insights that you would never have gotten if you tried to manually populate it or start with a preconceived notion of what the data is. Any of you guys deal with machine learning or deep learning? You know, the, the weird spooky science that we don't actually know why it works? Well, you know, there's two pieces of it. You train it and then you execute it. And the training algorithms rely on a huge quantity of kind of random data. And when you get that data and start to get insights, you feed it into algorithms that you don't really understand that actually change the behavior by driving those insights back out into the applications. And in fact, we end up with this really interesting kind of closed loop model where applications are not just what the user interacts with, they're actually where the data gets collected. They are forwarded into large scale data processing environments where we gather more and more data that we're not exactly sure is relevant, but the more we have and the more diversity of it is, we actually have a probability of getting a good answer. And then lastly, we take that data and we are injecting entirely new ways to analyze it and understand it, whether it be machine learning or deep learning or any of the big data suites that are out there. And then we feed it right back out to influence the behavior of the application that is the sensor. And we're starting to see this happen in things like IoT where you know, people deploy an IoT sensor saying, hey, gather all this telemetry because I don't know what it is and I might want to analyze it. But once you know what it is and you understand what's useful and what isn't useful, at the closed loop process, you actually start to change the behavior of the sensor. Hey, I don't care about that data. Give me more of this, because that can help me influence it in a more interesting way. And funny enough, this relationship, you know, while pretty obvious, in the new world, has a new characteristic, and that is the winners and losers are characterized not by people who can do all three of these things, but by who can do them faster. Who can close this loop as quickly as possible? If you can go from data gathering to data processing to gathering insight to influencing the outcomes faster than your competitor, your application architecture wins. And in order to do that, think about the new tooling you have. You have new application architectures deployed on new pieces of hardware, sensors, IoT devices, totally new stuff. You have new at scale data processing environments that if you use a legacy database there and your competitor uses an in-memory database, you're, you lost. <laughs> You have new algorithms and systems to basically understand how to process that data. If you're doing deep learning and machine learning and your other people are trying to process it with spreadsheets, um, guess who wins? <laughs> um, and more importantly, even if you did it using the ar 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 you know, archaic technology, but you did it faster than the people using the new technology because their system wasn't designed properly, you may actually still win. But the ideal world is using modern technology and closing this virtual circle as quickly as possible. that. So let me end with a, a fourth dimension. How many of you are familiar with a thing called the OSI model? I hope so. Good. Most people I talk to don't seem to know what that exists. Um, what, what's layer eight and nine? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So bottom line is, um, yeah, yeah, we got religion and a few others up there, but the bottom line is uh, not all technical problems are technical. And the last frontier that we're really interested in, and remember, this was not meant to be a comprehensive list. These are just illustrative that change is happening everywhere, deals with people. And the fact that fundamentally, the definition of our jobs, our roles, responsibilities, our skill sets are also changing because of all of these underlying things that I just talked about. And they're going to change more over the next decade. On the IT side, what we found is the definition of an IT professional is evolving very rapidly. And if you want to be a successful IT professional in the future, you kind of have to know what you're doing today, but you also have to become some new things. You have to become an expert in things like DevOps, because you have to realize that cloud architectures give you a way to automate away a lot of the things that you used to do manually, and to push the burden and the responsibility willingly to the developer. And it's actually goodness if you do it properly. Second, you are becoming more of a technology advisor. Because quite frankly, your developers want to use new technology, but they don't have the time to understand it. So who do they go to? You know, if you have a group that decides, I want to run, my, I want to build my next application in Docker containers, and they've never used Docker containers, 
What do you think their probability of success is going to be if they do it all by themselves with no help? Probably zero. Who should de-risk that? You know, uh, two years ago at Cisco Live, I did what, the closing keynote, and my advice to 20,000 people was, if you're an IT professional and you haven't built a cloud-native application, go build one now. Because at least you'll have built one before your developers build one, and you'll be able to give them advice about how to make it work properly. Okay? You'll be their technology advisor for new technologies. By the way, when post-flash memory shows up and your database administrator says, I want to use it, and if you've never heard of it, you're going to be in trouble. You need to learn about this stuff and be able to advise them about the pros and cons of these technologies. And then finally, you know, because the cloud era includes a lot of as-a-service technology, the IT professional has to be the service evaluator. They have to understand which SaaS offering is better than another SaaS offering. Not if we should use SaaS, but which one works better, which one meets our requirement, which one fits into a framework. And knowing those three things are kind of the key skills for a next generation IT professional. Interesting enough, if you're the CIO, <laughs> you get an interesting challenge because you don't own all the IT resources and you don't even own all the IT projects anymore because in the DevOps model, more and more of the coding is done in the business unit. Maybe not done in IT in many cases. So what do you become? And interestingly enough, even in this future world, let's say everything is cloud-based and off-prem and everything is cloud-native driven by the business units and there's no IT infrastructure. There's just no data center anywhere. You know, very unrealistic expectation, but let's say that happens. There's still a need for three functions. The first is there will still be data. Who knows where all the data is? Every business unit will create their own data. The best way to get a successful outcome is to reason across diverse data sets. If you don't even know where the diverse data sets are in aggregate, you can't do that. So IT has to keep track of that data. So we talk about this idea of the chief data officer. Second, unfortunately or fortunately, you continue to be the police. You're the chief auditor. Because now there's risk in every technology. You know, I have this rule of thumb about security technology or IT technology. All IT decisions you make will be additive or subtractive to your overall security posture. There is no neutral. You will never make an IT decision that doesn't positively or negatively influence your security posture. And that means that somebody has to be able to score those and understand where that risk is. And then third is most of your business units don't want to be the broker dealing with the providers of IT services. They want you to handle it for them. You know, they like this idea of just being able to consume services. I, I know everybody thinks programmers like to go to Amazon and put a credit card in. They actually don't want to do that. They do it because IT hasn't provided an alternative. But if they could just use those services or on-prem services and they were just available, that would be a heck of a lot easier than having to deal with a financial transaction or an expense report and all this other garbage that gets in the way. So the bottom line is the IT professional itself has new characteristics going forward. And by the way, most of these things are not the definition of CIOs or IT professionals right now because we haven't been forced to do this yet. But we're going to, trust me, if we get back together in five years, I bet that's in the job description of CIOs and IT professionals. The second dimension that makes me very nervous is here's a statistic that should kind of humble all of us. It's, it's good for everybody in this room because we're in this bucket, I think. And that is, this is the growth of computer scientists in aggregate in North America, or actually I think in the US, since 2000 to 2016. What do you notice about this chart? Didn't go up very much. Population grew, but we, we don't have 10 times the number of computer scientists and programmers and coders that we had you know, 20 years ago. Which is amusing because 20 years ago we had far fewer computers. We were doing less interesting things. And the reason for this is a little bit disturbing. The first is we're just not creating enough of them. This is a chart that shows you advanced placement uh, coursework based on social sciences, English, history, mathematics, science, and computer science. Notice the one at the bottom. So we're not really driving people into this. So we have a bit of a responsibility problem here. Second, from a diversity perspective, I know Usenix is very on this, Cloud Foundry is on this, we all believe that, hey, get more people from any area into computer science, into technology as goodness. But honestly, we've done a mediocre job. These are the rates of women, African-American, Hispanic participation in computer science. Okay? Now, I, I don't, this is neither good nor bad, it just is. But what it tells us is if we look forward, everything I just described says we will be writing more code. We will be more dependent on software. We will be building more computer-oriented systems. And these tell us that there is not some huge, untapped, qualified pool of people sitting out there waiting for a job. <laughs> they don't exist. And so while we have to fix this, this will take decades to fix. Even if we do everything right, this problem 
won't go away for another decade or two. And it's unlikely we'll do everything right. So given that kind of doom and gloom scenario, we have software eating the world, we're gonna need a lot more capability to use these systems, we're entirely dependent on computer science and technology, and we just don't have enough people who know how to do it. They're just not trained, they're not coming into the workforce, they're not coming out of primary school. What do we do about it? Well, first we should try to fix that problem long term, but the second is we have to do some things tactically today. And the biggest things that we have to do are twofold. The first is we have to reskill our existing people. We have got to look at our existing pool of computer scientists and make sure that they have access to the technology learning to understand cloud native applications, to understand new programming frameworks. How many of you have worked in things like Go or Spring? Yeah, you all should. Okay. If you're a computer scientist, go spend a weekend. It's not that hard. They're actually high level programming languages. Um, you know, well, Spring isn't a programming language, but it's a framework. But um, bottom line though, is we have to make investments in trying to get in front of people the tools and technologies so that they can actually use these and become proficient in the new programming languages. Because if we end up with half of our population writing in Fortran and Pascal, which you know, it's kind of an overstatement, um, uh, and not writing in Go and, and next generation programming languages, or at least not being proficient in it, we're gonna have an even bigger problem. The good news is it's solvable with technology. Now here's an example. We, we have a big bet on big data and analytics. And at EMC, we said, well, you know, hey, let's use MOOCs. Let's put content out there. Let's work with, let's make it available. And here's an example where we put one up, uh, you know, that basically, we didn't even advertise it, interestingly enough. We just kind of threw it out there on big data analytics, I think it was. And we had, uh, what was it, 11, uh, 13,000 people enrolled. <laughs> uh, wasn't advertised, didn't really care. It was just kind of, let's see what happens. Um, we had, you know, almost 2,000 people pass the test learn the technology, and it was a technical course. It was trying to get people to understand how to work with Hadoop, how to work with Spark, how to work with these systems. And so we have to make these investments. USENIX is a good forum to do that, but we need a lot more of this because it's not gonna be magic happens and there's more programmers. We're gonna need the existing programmers to know the new stuff. And that is to be a conscious effort from the industry, not just individuals, but everyone. Otherwise, we're gonna have a huge problem here. The second is we have to rethink how we program. Because even if I teach you new skills, if your efficiency and productivity is kind of what it was 10 years ago, I don't have more people, so I need to get more work out of it. I need to get more code out of you. I need to be able to move quicker. And the good news here is there are a lot of new programming models and development models that are materializing that actually do give us a way to move faster. You know, a great example, have any of you been to a Cloud Foundry Dojo or Pivotal Labs or any of these kind of extreme agile environments? Um, you know, we have one in Cambridge, come by. It's open, love to talk to you. Um, you know, IBM has one, Pivotal has one on Howard Street in, uh, in, in San Francisco. You know, designed to kind of expose people to these new ideas and help them learn how to operate in these new paradigms. But the core principle inside of something like Cloud Foundry, from a programming perspective, it adopts models like paired programming. Has anybody done paired programming? Kind of pisses off a lot of old school developers because it's this idea, you're writing code and somebody's looking over your shoulder. But the idea behind it is if you have two programmers working on code, one is writing and one is error checking, and you're doing it in real time, you eliminate most of the QA cycle. Have you done continuous integration? You know, you're developing code and you've built it with the proper interlock and, and safety measures, and you can actually just drop the code into an executable environment because it's, it's modularized enough to do that. What happens? You move faster, you generate more output. This idea, I mean, we, we did a great job going from waterfall to agile in certain environments, but there's a next wave of this using paired programming, continuous integration, continuous development, that allow us to actually take that same pool of developers and increase dramatically the output of code. Again, the fact that we all haven't done that yet is kind of problematic, because everything we just described, every enterprise is gonna be driven by software and data, <laughs> no matter what industry you're in. The technologies underneath it are gonna create disruptions that allow us to do really cool things only if we can change our software and data and take advantage of them. And the missing link is do we have enough people that can actually do this and do they have enough time to do enough of it? And so we have to retrain them or at least give them access to the new technologies and make it open for them. By the way, in Cloud Foundry, the concept of Cloud Foundry dojos was mostly because we had an existential risk with something like Cloud Foundry. If we deliver this great platform but nobody knows how to use it, that's problematic. We needed developers that could not just use it, but could also make core contributions to the open source. 
and they needed to have an environment that the companies created that didn't require a fee or a course that people could just come in and work on projects and be part of the community and learn these new models. And it was totally self-serving because we wanted to create a bigger developer base using these new technologies, new approaches that would allow us to move the project forward. It's worked pretty well because CloudFormer went from kind of nothing to 48% of the cloud native apps in the world are running on it today in two years. Um, but there are other examples where we're starting to see that. So anyway, I'll wrap up. This was meant to be a bit of a journey. Um, remember the core thesis. Change is happening everywhere. All of you have been in the industry for more than 10 years. No change is a constant. But right now, we have change happening at every layer, whether it's infrastructure or cloud or application or people. And we're kind of getting used to it. But don't get too complacent because you know, in that second part of this discussion, what I described are a whole set of things that we haven't even begun to operationalize and institutionalize yet that we're going to have to over the next literally three years. We will have a change in the fundamental physical building block of data and how it interacts between memory and persistence. And that's, a, that's like an atomic unit of IT that is going to be completely turned on its head over the next five years. It will have implications on how we build everything from databases to applications to data processing. Above that, we are entering an era where it is very likely that our topology will be multi-cloud. And our problem will not be selecting which clouds we use, but making them all work together, which is a much more complex problem to solve. But we have to solve it, and that's the only way we can be successful. Above that, our application architectures are moving from essentially a non-real-time legacy paradigm to a fully integrated real-time paradigm in which both the system of record and the system of engagement are completely being re-engineered with new architectures, and they're now working together at a speed that is orders of magnitude more complex and faster than we've ever seen. And then above it, to make life fun for all of us, you know, again, good news for this group because we'll all be employed. But the bad news is we have a gating factor that even if we wanted another 5 million software developers in North America, they don't exist. It will take decades for that to happen. And so we're going to have to get really creative about reskilling and exposing our current development communities to these new technologies. And we're going to have to get really smart about stripping away all of the silliness and inefficiency in our development processes. Because every second that you're not spending building value-added code is a waste of time. And it's actually putting at risk the ability for you to do these digital transformations and to actually effectively execute IT. So this is a bit of a doom and gloom discussion. But by the way, you know that's kind of what we're in, in for. But uh, that's why we're all in the industry. If you wanted a nice, comfortable industry, I'd encourage you to, I don't know, go into, I don't know what it would be, maybe politics or something. Um, <laughs> It's the entertainment industry these days. So anyway, uh, you know, uh, th 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 thanks very much for hearing me out. I mean, you know, again, it was meant to be high level. Hopefully, this ties to a lot of the things that you'll be talking about over the next, you know, over the last couple of days and going into the future. You know, love to keep the dialogue going. You know, you know, we're now, you know, I'm fortunate to be in a company that now kind of spans all of this. Um, <laughs> it's both good and bad. Um, but you know, quite frankly, it's our journey. It, you know, we all are on this journey because if. I screw up on the persistent media part, and we don't get that to work. Or if you screw up on the operations piece or the application development piece, these things don't come to fruition. And quite frankly, we've underperformed. And I think the good news is that you know, when IT actually snaps together and all these technologies get adopted, we do really interesting, disruptive things. And we look back and say, man, that looked like science fiction 10 years ago, but it was actually technology and people that got us there. So again, thanks for your time. I appreciate your attention, and glad to be here. We'd like to open up. Oh, sorry, open it up for uh, Q and A. Um, but I would ask that you use the microphones. We've got microphones one, two, three, on, in the aisles here. And feel free. We've got about another ten minutes or so for uh, Q and A. Thank you, John. Okay. Great. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Rick Farrow, and I I thought you left out one piece of the NVRAM picture. I left out many pieces of the well, NVRAM picture. Well, many pieces. <laughs> yes, you you really did. I, I really. You know, I really liked what you were saying about yeah. it because I've been watching this myself for a while. I can really see this is where we're going. Yeah. But, um, and, you know, you mentioned what happens when your application crashes. Yeah. Um, what we're going to have, and perhaps you could address this, we're going to have file systems that are in these NVRAMs because you need yeah. a way of organizing the data. Exactly. And so this will be very different because we've had file systems based on blocks. Now we have bytes, 
Exactly. So you, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely correct. I, I, I think we, um, we have some early examples. You know, there's, a, there's a, a couple of next generation databases out there, like uh, Volt is a good example that kind of assumes in memory. And it's interesting because what they've done is kind of radically simplified and redesigned the lower level elements of that database. Uh, you know, and, and so there's early indications of how people are thinking about data organization for large scale in memory. So we don't necessarily have to, uh, they may not be right, but at least they're an example of it. And so if you want to take a look at ways that people are addressing this in a, in a very narrow sense, these kind of next generation databases that work on memory semantics only, even if they're running on other media, they, they think of everything as memory, tends to be the right approach. What I do believe though is, remember that that layer is not just a execution environment. It is also likely to be the long-term persistent environment. And so we're actually not just going to have new classes of file systems and data organization that deal down to the byte level or maybe even the bit level in some cases. Hard to access a bit in, a, in any chip, to be perfectly honest. Uh, um, but, the, but those are going to sit right next to key value stores, different types of object stores that are going to be around them. Now, one of the more interesting things we've discovered is, well, maybe you can start to tier between them. Maybe some of this propagation and reformatting of data, uh, things like deduplication of the data in the runtime environment can actually happen to generate efficiency. Now, there's no algorithm out there that does that right now. You know, how do you dedupe memory properly you know, at, at this type of scale? But should we? We know that if you have repeatable bit patterns and you can put a bit of algorithms on top of it, you can probably get a two or four or 10 to one efficiency metric. These, this stuff is cheaper, but not free. <laughs> and it's scalable, but not infinite. And so we're gonna see a lot of these architectures occur. It won't just be the data organization model, the file system, the database placement algorithms, which already there are examples of that being done today, but it will also be these other data services like dealing with data efficiency across them and even data migration in the substrate that we're gonna to have to solve for. Uh, but but I, t take a look at Volt as a good example of what that lowest level of the stack might look like in a memory-centric database architecture. Well, thanks very much. Great. Hi, uh, Paul Kreese at Qualcomm. Uh, what do you see as uh, some techniques that we might use to initiate a cultural shift from a legacy IT organization to yep. a developer oriented organization you know our, our experience has been there's just a lot of inertia and people just want to sit there and you know answer their tickets but yeah. they don't really want to learn code yeah. and you know what have been some techniques that you've seen to be successful at, at initiating that transition so so two that, that come to mind that we've seen be successful um, you know first is not necessarily IT specific but it's more in general and that is create a distinct environment you know when we created pivotal we literally it, we created a separate company and we built it around pivotal labs which is this very very extreme agile paired programming environment it, you know if you go in it it has no concept of a traditional programming environment it's long list of tables people working on you know, projects, all in this extreme agile, paired programming, continuous integration model. Um, we did that and it worked really well for us. And then as we started to commercialize it, what we started to see is our customers who really wanted to go on this journey, they attempted at first to try to bring these t new approaches into their existing environment and they all failed because there was too much inertia against it. And so they started to build a secondary organization somewhere else. Like Humana is a great example. It is actually a good story. Humana is an early cloud foundry adopter and cloud native app, you know, they're a healthcare company. They're pretty interesting. Um, when the Apple Watch shipped, there's an app on there called Q. It's not on the watch, but it was the first, one of the first healthcare apps uh, delivered for the Apple Watch. It's called Q. It was built by Humana. It was built by a separate team in a separate city that was given some protection to operate entirely in this cloud native development model. Now, their goal was not to be a different company. Their goal was to build a wellness application for Humana. But there was a very conscious decision at the top that the first couple of these would not be successful if they tried to do it in a commingled environment. Now, over time, what has happened is that that kind of dojo they have where they built those applications has become a place where they are retraining people and we're starting to see it blur back into the mainstream. So we've definitely seen this model of uh, People who try to commingle it too early usually fail. People who build a distinct environment, even if it takes a bit more energy and it creates a bit of stratification and politics, it generally is more successful. The second piece of advice that I give you is 
most people run around in the IT side when they hear cloud native and they say, I don't have an app I need to build in cloud native today. And so they just never get to it. They have plenty of people who want to do it. They might have even decided to do it this way, but they don't have a project. And the reality of it is, is you can build any app in a traditional or cloud native model. It, it's totally dependent on just having the desire to do it that way. You know, I mean, I can build a ERP app in cloud native. That's perfectly fine. I can build a, you know, a mobile app in cloud native. And so the other piece of advice that seems to have worked is regardless of whether or not you have a business justification or, or you can do it using your legacy model, identify a couple of projects in your pipeline that you're just going to do in a cloud native model. You're going to build them with microservices. You're going to build them on a PaaS. You're going to build them in containers and see what happens. And again, what we see is it gets people over the hump that they realize that it's not an either or. You could use either approach. They're just tools. But until you've done a few of them, you really can't measure whether they're going to be successful. So you use all of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt to never do it. And so it's kind of these two principles. First, don't try to commingle. Start with an isolated group. It sounds counterintuitive, but it usually works better. And the second is you, you just got to pick a few, I, I hate to say it, legacy backlog applications or problems you're trying to solve and just decide that a team will go off and build that in a cloud native model and, you know, quite frankly, measure the results after. But, but inevitably, you'll find that it works and it gets people to be comfortable that every future application they develop, they start to consciously decide which side to do it on. But until you break the deadlock, it, it just stands there and spins. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Hi, Alice Goldfuss. Uh, you spoke a lot about storage and changing environments. And I was wondering, in this politically charged climate that tech is a part of, what responsibility do we have to our users about the data we collect and store? Yeah. Well, we have lots of responsibility to our users. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I don't want to go into politics, but you know, you. you especially having worked for a Chinese company where I got to be public enemy number one for the intelligence community pre-Snowden, which was kind of fun. Um, uh, the, yeah, weird, weird experience. You can go Google me at, uh, in Hong Kong talking about that a couple years before Snowden. It was interesting. Uh, anyway, the, um, the, the, I mean, the responsibilities don't go away. Right now, uh, one of the reasons why we will fail in uh, essentially these data-driven environments is that people will insist on an opt-in or they will opt out because they are afraid of misuse of the data. And so there's two ways you deal with that. One is purely political and sociological and policy-driven where you just commit to not do bad things with the data. Now, I'm not sure any of us really trust that that isn't irreversible. The second thing that is more interesting, and you know, Radia may talk about this later, I don't know, she's been doing a bunch of work in this space around there are new compute models where, where sometimes you don't have to aggregate all the data to get insight from it. The data doesn't necessarily have to all be in one place under one authoritative domain. It just needs to be shareable in a trustworthy way. And so things like secure enclaves and kind of Intel architecture are ways for you to process data where a bunch of people inject stuff in, but they come from different sources, but nobody really owns all of it, but the processing can happen, and when it's done, it goes back, and it's destroyed, and you're happy. And so. Uh, unfortunately, that most of this is pretty immature. I mean, I, th I think Radio will talk about things like homomorphic encryption, which is, you know, interesting technology, but a bit of overhead associated with it. Where you know, it's this idea that you, you know, can analyze encrypted data. You know, you have two numbers. You know that the answer of adding them together is four, but you have no idea what the numbers are. Um, you know, there are there are still inefficiencies in these architectures, but they exist. So I would argue that there's definitely the political approach, and I don't really want to guess whether or not we'll be successful with that. But there are technology approaches that. When we think about processing data and building our IT architectures from a security perspective, this idea of federated data that isn't ever fully aggregated except when you analyze it, and if the analytics are done in a trustworthy independent space that can be destroyed afterwards and only the outcome can come back, that's a very useful vehicle to kind of get people comfortable that you've never really allocated it fully into one place where it can be misused. Uh, biggest area for this, by the way, and, and there's a big effort in Boston around this, is around genomics. You know, genomics is, you know, your genome is your most personally identifiable information you can imagine. And if you're not concerned about it, you should be, because if you sit down with some folks at MIT, you'll hear about, you know, this idea of, uh, uh, you know, DNA synthesis. <laughs> if I have your genome, I can create DNA. If I can create DNA, I can plant it in a crime scene. If suddenly the DNA evidence says you were there murdering somebody and you don't have a good alibi, even if it was fake DNA, you're going to jail. Um, that information is pretty important. 
And one of the problems is people realize how important it is, but in order for us to go and cure cancer or solve medical issues or deal with you know, the real advances, we need very large data sets coming from a very diverse set of data sources. And so this idea of kind of federated secure processing and using the compute infrastructure and kind of passing enough data into trustworthy neutral spaces at the compute layer that are actually heavily protected might be one of the vehicles we have. But I don't think we have a great answer, but I do think we have a technology track if we can make it efficient and scalable that allows us to do this kind of federated processing without aggregating the data. And I still think we have the political track because you know, any company that doesn't stand up and say, I'm not going to steal and misuse your data, you shouldn't do business with. Um, but Thank we'll you. see. Okay. One more, okay. Okay, great. Well, we have one more person, so. Okay. My timing's excellent. Uh, David Kovar representing myself. Um, you talked about security, uh, software engineering and increasing the efficiency of that particular process. I didn't hear you talk about security engineering, where you're starting to talk about embedding security throughout the entire life cycle, all the way back into the educational process. Because I see people coming out of schools understanding how to do software engineering, but they don't understand how to build security in from the very beginning yeah. to the very end of this entire life cycle. How do we get security engineering in there while also getting that increased speed that you're talking about? Um, well, first, not, not meant as an oversight. It's one of the many things that we could talk about. I, you know, I kind of go back to the, uh, my, part of my background is in the security industry developing security standards. And um, <laughs> the, the, you know, 100% agree. If we don't build secure code, if we don't have secure architectures that's embedded into it, not an afterthought, this all doesn't matter. Um, what I would tell you, though, is that um, there was an early way of doing this, which is currently kind of the state of the art, which is, you know, go and train everybody, put a bunch of process as an additional thread through the development process that's explicit to security, but independent, meaning it, it's this other, you know, if you look at the coding process, the testing process, what we did over the last several years, most legitimate companies, is they said, well, we really want to build secure code, so we're going to have a secure code initiative, we're going to train people, and we're going to put a bunch of checks and balances as we develop the code, but we're going to have security be a very explicit element that, that you could actually throw away and still build code. Okay? <laughs> because it, it, you, know, it, 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 you build insecure code, but you could still get away with it. And I think that's okay, and we should do that. But when I look forward and you look at things like paired programming, you know, it, it, it opens up a new opportunity, even the continuous integration process, where you actually can insert sanity checking and, and, and let's call it security QA and security assessment in real time as an independent entity, as part of the core programming methodology. Like, imagine you're doing a paired programming effort, and by the way, this is exactly is what happens. The person that's doing the QA is not just looking for bugs in the code, but they're trying to make sure that you're complying with the security decisions you've made in your architecture. And you're doing it as you're writing the code. You're not shortcutting things. And that's happening literally every line of code that's being written. There's a human being there. Now that's one dimension. When you do continuous integration, we have opportunities to, on a much smaller sized piece of code, introduce things like you know, everything from open source content checking to vulnerability checking at a, a small code segment level as we're in the continuous integration process. So those mechanisms give us better tools to kind of blend it more deeply into the development process than the typical secure, secure coding initiatives of the past where we created this kind of overlay that was still very pervasive but it was very much viewed as kind of another layer in the coding process as opposed to just something that the pair ought to be focused on and just something that's part of continuous integration. So, so but, but you're absolutely right. We have to be conscious about it. We have to realize that our outcomes are all un unsuccessful if we build great technology that's fundamentally insecure, unreliable, and risky. <laughs> it's just, you know, so, uh, you know, that, that, that by the way, in that fir the third slide, the fifth item was we have to build trustworthy, transparent, IT solutions, and that means they have to be fundamentally secure. But I think that as we think about new development methodologies and new toolings and new architectures for how we build code, we should think about ways to kind of make the security outcomes part of that core thread as opposed to a secure computing initiative on top of it. I just think that was a good triage, but it's not the right long-term answer. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay.